topics. <clears throat> so, for this lecture, it's a very unexciting topic. I feel like everyone finds it always very hard to remember, myself included. So I'm going to try and cover really the main things you should know as a medical student and that are relevant so, you know, for your clinical practice once you become doctors. Um, and the main things we'll be talking about is sort of what are milestones and the, I'm really going to focus on the normal child, but also what are the red flags, the sort of things that you will be asked about and that you should really know anyway, uh, clinical practice. But, you know, without going into too much detail of development, because we could be talking about this for hours and hours. And so we'll be talking a little bit about developmental delay and, and just touching on causes of developmental delay. And I've tried to summarise um, basically all the milestones as much as possible and try to make them memorable, for, you know, within limits. Oh, wow, I can do that. Um, so, you know, you will see summaries throughout the lecture and I hope they'll be a bit useful, you know, towards the end. And like I mentioned, keep an eye out for red flags because those are really the main things that you're probably going to be asked about in exams. So it's worth, at least if there's nothing else to remember of this lecture, at least try to remember the red flags. So we'll start right away with question one and I'll give you a second to read it. All right. Yes, very good. So I think the vast majority of you picked out that a nine month old, you know, if we're talking about gross motor, um, then we'd be worried whether if, if this child is not sitting by nine months old. I remember a few people put cannot grasp, but that's a fine motor. Um, so remember, that's, uh, you know, read the question. <laughs> right. So little brief overview about developmental milestones. So when we talk about developmental milestones, we're talking about um, steps in a child's development, and these are skills that we look at a child, you know, we'd expect a child to achieve between birth and five years of age, really. That's kind of the limit that we're looking at. And there are four main domains I'm sure you've heard about. There's gross motor, which is probably the, you know, one of the biggest ones, earlier one and easier to remember. Vision and fine motor, and hearing, speech and language, and in social, emotional, and behavioral. And the reason why I've put these arrows are sort of, you know, kind of scattered going down is because these, this is kind of the order in which these, the, these milestones will be achieved by children. So often they will start, first of all, showing, you know, hitting gross motor milestones. And then as they grow older, then their development will include more and more, you know, refined skills and things like, you know, fine motor and more complex social behaviors. And the reason why they are grouped together as well, you know, vision and fine motor, hearing, speech and language, it's because they are related, you know, very intimately related. So in order to develop fine motor, you need good vision, as you'll see later on, and things like, you know, in order to talk, you need to be able to first hear, you know, it makes sense <laughs> once you think about it, but that's really why they're grouped into these four main domains. So the figures that we look at when we talk about developmental milestones and when we give an age in which we expect a child to achieve a milestone are two main figures. So we talk about the median age, which is the one you'll often see mentioned in textbooks, like, you know, we expect a child of six months old to be able to do this and that. So that's what we're talking about when we give that age. But then the other really important figures, you know, to remember are the limit ages. And when we talk about limit ages, we're talking about standard deviations from the mean. Um, so the limit age is within two standard deviations from the mean, which means that, you know, 
by that age, we expect 97.5% of children to have achieved that milestone. And it's a, in a way, it is a lot more useful than just talking about median ages because children will hit these milestones at different ages at different rates. Um, so although you know, the pattern and the rate at which milestones are hit can be very different from child to child, um, um, the way, you know, <laughs> the kind of order in which these are hit is remarkably constant between children. And that's why we can talk about limit ages. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the median ages, lots of textbooks, including, you know, guidelines and NICE talk about slightly different ages. So don't get too hung up on, you know, remembering exactly what a nine month old and a 12 and an 18 month old will do but try and be consistent and be structured in the way you remember it so that, that you know, that's also the way you'll be doing it clinically. And then we'll see there's lots of different ways to score these, but for your exams, remember the limit ages and just be consistent if you ever have to do, you know, a developmental assessment as a, say, an OSCE or something like that, which I think is quite unlikely <laughs> in medical school, but it could be. Um, so let's start talking about gross motor development. Now, like I mentioned, this is the first one that tends to develop in children, and it really is the easiest to remember. Um, you'll see these children <clears throat> developing the gross motor skills quite rapidly in the very first years, well, first years, the first months of life, and up to you know three, four years old. Um, but in the first year, there is really quite a steep um, you know, learning curve for these children in terms of gross motor development. And they will correlate. The reason why I really talk about the first year is because the development of gross motor milestones relies on the disappearance of primitive reflexes. Um, now, I haven't really talked about, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about primitive reflexes in this particular lecture because it will take us much longer to go into all of those. But just vaguely remember, you know, gross motor milestone rely on the disappearance of primitive reflexes. And that's because, you know, say you've got a stepping reflex and you're lifting a child and every time he's bouncing his toes on the table, then they will never learn to put full weight on their toes in order to walk, say, or sit. Um, that's why you, these reflexes need to go before the child can hit the milestones. Now, the other important thing is that, which will make it really, you know, it will click in your mind and you're like, aha, yeah, that makes sense, is that it follows a head to toe pattern. In fancy words, we call it a cephalocaudal pattern of development. And that kind of really makes sense from a physiology point of view, because myelination happens first from the head down, you know, so you, you start getting better control of your skeletal muscles from the head and then later on your toes. Um, so, you know, when we talk about first, we start looking for head support and head control. And then, you know, walking later on, that's because it follows this pattern. So remember that because it's quite a useful one. So these are the median ages for gross motor development. And I've drawn this, sorry, particularly ugly baby that you'll see in the right corner. I'm not an artist, but just to give you an idea of, you know, uh, the development, like I mentioned, head to toe. And if you picture, you know, a baby like this, then I think it's quite a nice way to remember in steps what happens roughly, at least to guide you in order to then fit in the median ages to remember it. So we're talking about cephalocaudal. So first of all, it will start at about three months, a baby should be able to raise their head to prone, you, you know, just show some good head control. We then move on to core muscles such as sitting upright without support. So that's under point two. Um, and you know, they'll need to just be able to hold themselves up and have head control at the same time in order to sit up, you know, if you imagine. Then we move to the knees <laughs> and the hip, you know, girdle region, so they can crawl. And that's expected about a nine month old. And then once all, all of these are achieved, then a child will be able to start walking. And um, so a 12 month old, you know, a 10 month old, it might stand, and just cruise around furniture to so hold on to things and walk um, or you know hold on to a parent's hand and just stand up and at 12 months they should be walking and at 15 months they should walk pretty well all right so these are sort of the main milestones and obviously there's things like jumping and you know that happens later but you have to have achieved all of these before you can do any more complicated things 
So like I mentioned, after 15 months, it really becomes all about fine tuning. So first of all, a child will be able to run, you know, and bump into things and then end up in A&E. <laughs> and then they'll be able to jump um, and walk upstairs one step at a time. Um, then at three, that's kind of, lots of people remember, three years old, ride a tricycle. It's a nice way to remember. And then at four, you know, at four, they'll be pretty much like a little adult. They'll go up and down the stairs, they'll walk, they'll run, they'll jump. So you'd expect a four-year-old really to be moving, at least in terms of gross motor, pretty solidly. Now, these are the numbers that I'd really like you to remember. Um, they're most useful, I think, for exams. You know, like I mentioned, all the other ones are quite, they can change from textbook to textbook. But these ones tend to be the pretty solid, you know, ones that you might be asked about. Um, and these are the ones that, you know, we'd be worrying about, say, in a clinic or if you're in GP and a parent comes to you and they're worried, you know, I don't think my child is doing what they're supposed to do by their age. These are the numbers you really be looking at. So if a child doesn't have any head control by four months old, that's when we worry about it. If they're not sitting unsupported by nine months old, like our child in question one, if they're not standing by 12 months, and if they're not walking by 18 months. So if you remember, you know, we'd expect a child to be walking by themselves, you know, the median age is about a year old, you know, 12 months, but if it's not happened by 18 months, I don't know why this one in particular tends to come up quite a lot in exams. <laughs> this one and sitting unsupported, I would say are pretty good ones to remember. So like I mentioned, I'm gonna be building a summary as we go through this lecture. Um, so that you guys, you know, if you want, you can screenshot it or copy it down or just take some inspiration for your notes. Um, but I've tried to summarize all the milestones in a little bit of a table. So we're starting with gross motor and the figures in red, you know, the words in red are the limit ages and the red flags that you should try and remember. Um, so I'm not going to go through much into this, I've kind of talked about it, but it's just a little bit of a summary they'll be building up during the lecture. All right, question two, give you a time, bit of time to read. Oops, sorry. Sorry guys, I accidentally gave the answer <laughs> immediately. Well, well done for, I'm hoping you had a bit of thinking <laughs> yourself. So yes, so this is a four month old. And really what we're worried about is that by four months, this child is not fixing and following, which is a bit worrying really. So like I mentioned, when it comes to fine motor development, we group it together with vision because they really go hand in hand pun intended. <laughs> so, um, you know, being able to see really is a prerequisite for all fine motor functions. Um, it kind of makes sense. Um, and that's why, you know, we when we do the newborn examination, we spend, you know, there's a whole dedicated section just looking at baby's eyes. Now, it's useful, at least I think it's useful to think about it as, you know, in order to be able to look at objects and move your head around and see, you need to have a little bit of gross motor development, at least some head control, um, which is why it's useful to think that, you know, gross motor are sort of the very first milestones being met and then all the others ones follow later. And I think another useful way to try and remember fine motor, which is a little bit more complicated, a bit harder to remember than gross motor, is to think that there's a sequence. And um, so you start with having a sequence of, you know, you see an object or so a child sees an object, then tries to reach the object, tries to hold the object, 
holds it a bit better and then is actually doing something with the tools that it finally has got in their hands. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like with gross motor, we're talking about head to toe, with vision and fine motor, I like to think of like, you know, a child trying to grab something and then doing something with the object. So again, these are the um, median ages at which we expect children to be able to do things in fine motor development. And you'll see it follows kind of this sequence that I mentioned. So first of all, they need to be able to follow objects by turning their heads, so fixing and following, which is usually expected by six weeks. Then by four months, they will be reaching out for objects. And then at six months, they'll be able to hold them you know, with their hands, so it's all like palmer grasp. So, you know, it's kind of like this is not a very good hold, but they can at least secure them. At seven months, they start passing objects from hand to hand, and then they develop further, like finer skills. Now at 10 months, they can do pincer grip. Um, and later on, we start talking about cubes and squiggles. So I would say up until a year of age, it's all about passing objects and holding them better. And then from a year onwards, they actually start to interact with the objects a lot better. So at 18 months, they'll be doing, you know, building a tower of four cubes. At two years, eight cubes, they can draw a line. Um, at two and a half, you know, all these lines, I don't know why they really like these in exams because they're quite hard to remember, but I've tried to make, put a slide with a bit of, bit, bit of a summary because there's, you know, circles and squares and crosses. Um, which tend to come up um, in exams. So this is my attempt at summary to <laughs> um, kind of talk about cubes and drawings by looking at the numbers. I don't know how useful this is, but you guys will let me know. So by one year of age or, you know, around 15 months, we expect them to be able to draw a squiggle and stack two, cu two cubes. By two years old, they should be able to draw a line. And if you imagine sort of the bottom of the two, maybe they can help you remember a line and they can stack lots of cubes in cubes. By three, they become a bit less interested in cubes and they start building bridges with the cubes and they can draw a nice circle, like the fat part of the three. Um, when they're four, they can draw a cross and they can build a stair through your steps with the cubes. And by four and a half, they start making a square and I think, you know, you can convince yourself that there's a, you know, logic progression, logical progression. So, you know, at first you squiggle, then you're a bit better, you can do a line. A circle is a lot easier than a cross or a square because all you have to do is kind of like a prolonged line that you can join up. And then a cross, it's easier, obviously, than a square because you don't have to go from corner to corner. So, you know, so that's kind of like a way to remember it. But you know, the reality is that you're just gonna have to remember it, <laughs> whichever way it works for you. Now, in terms of limit ages for fine vision and fine motion development, again, try and remember these as much as you can, which is fixing and following by three months, um, reaching for objects by six months. And remember, this is a skill that we usually see in four months old, transferring by nine months, pincer grip. I would say this is a pretty good date to remember out of all of them again a favorite of exams which is 12 months and then casting uh, which you will read sometimes in textbooks which is like you know just chucking things around the room that should stop you know it, you know um that should be up to 18 months basically um uh, fine. so again just a little summary that we're building up um and i'm hoping by the end this will be a little bit useful for you guys to see you know, all the skills that a nine month old, six month old and so on um, should be doing. All right. Okay, question three, I won't touch the laptop this time.
All right, a little bit torn. So yes, um, what we're really worried about is this bit about this, you know, 10 month old not using any consonants and still using cooing sounds. And there's a little bit of, you know, clue about not seeming interested in what parents have to say, which for a 10 month old might not be entirely surprising, but maybe with the cooing um, is a bit worrying. So, um, talking about hearing speech and language, I mean, it, it kind of, it's a bit obvious, I guess, that hearing is fundamental for the development of speech. Um, and again, you know, like we said earlier that we do screening for vision due to night, we do autoacoustic emissions and newborns pretty quickly. Um, and that's because, you, you know, not being able to hear can really, really affect your development. And it's an entirely reversible cause of developmental delay, which should be picked up early. Um, and that's because, you know, in order to uh, understand a command um, or, you know, just be aware of your surrounding, first of all, you need to hear it so you can then recognize it again, and then you can copy it, and then you can create. And that's, again, sort of the way the hearing speech and language follows uh, you know in terms of development and try and pick out I think try and pick out these patterns in development just I think it just makes it a bit easier to remember because otherwise it's really tricky um, and also interesting note that you know hearing function is the best predictor of cognitive function and school performance um, so you know really trying to help children have problems with hearing is quite important and autoacoustic emissions are really important to do um, in newborns. Um, so these again are the median ages, sorry, these are not very interesting slides, but there's no really other way to present them. Um, so by six weeks, we'd expect a child to, you know, still to voice and startle, um, which is a good sign that they are hearing, obviously, <laughs> if they jump at a loud noise. Then once they've heard these noises, they will try and chat away and coo and vocalize. And, you know, it's their way of copying all the noises and they, they hear from parents, which should happen around four to six months. Um, and by seven months, you know, once they start having a little bit of object permanence, as we'll see later on, they will turn to soft sounds. They are not immediately in their sight and they'll start looking for them. By 10 months, um, they should be calling for mum and dad, knowing which parents they're calling for, for you know, that's what dis discriminately means here, um, you know, rather than just saying mum and dad for whatever parents or whatever person is around them. Um, and by 12 months, really, we really expect a child to use um, two to three words other than mum and dad. Um, by 18 months, they're pretty good. You know, they know at least six, six to 10 words and they can point at parts of the body. You know, like if you tell them what, which one's your nose, they should know which one it is and point at it. Um, and by two years, you know, after two years, they really, you know, speech becomes a really big part of development. Um, so they'll start being able to join two more words to make sentences by the time you're two. Um, and by the time they're two and a half to three, they'll be talking all the time. Um, so, um, you know, maybe you won't be able to keep them quiet. Um, now, in terms of uh, red flags, uh, again, good one to remember, really, I think, is the 18 months. You know, not saying any words by 18 months um, is one that's pretty useful to remember, both for real life and exams. I'm being completely unintelligible by four years. The polysyllabic and consonant babble, they're a bit hard to remember and know exactly what they mean. You know, consonant babble are things like mama and dada um, and other words that have got a little bit of consonants in them rather than just, you know, vowels. Um, <laughs> so that's when you'd expect children to be able to meet these milestones. There we go again. So another little line of summary. Um, you know, I think it starts, it starts making sense, you know, and um, if you think about what a six week old baby say should be able to do is really just start to be aware of their surroundings. So have some head control so they can, you know, follow, follow movements, follow objects and, you know, recognize loud noises. And, um, you know, I think some people find it useful to picture a child at a particular age to remember their development. You know, if you're quite, I guess, a visual learner, that'd be a useful way to do it, which I think why is this, this table might be helpful to you perhaps. 
Okay, question four. <laughs> well done. <laughs> you guys didn't get <laughs> trapped by my um, my um, my trap, I guess. <laughs> so um, basically, this question is really just to highlight the importance of correcting for age, but also knowing that corrected age for premature babies, you, you know, children is really only up to two years. So by two years onwards, you'd expect a child to be meeting all their milestones. Um, as they normally would. And so for any three and a half year old, not engaging in interactive play is uh, a worry in terms of social behavior. Okay, so in terms of this domain, it really is the more, you know, most complex, I would say the hardest to remember. Um, and it really is the one that tends to develop, as you would imagine, a bit later on, because in order to um, show emotions, you know, be social, you need to be able to do all the things we've talked about before. You know, you might be able to need to be able to walk and talk and, you know, pass objects and interact with people and friends and, you know, talk to your parents because you want to tell them that you're upset. Um, and in fact, it, this domain is the one that's most affected by any other delay in any other domain. Um, you know, you know, any issues with even gross motor can really affect social, emotional and behavioural domains. Um, and also, you know, the environment that children grow in, um, you know, think about neglect and things like that. It will really affect this domain in particular. Um, and maternal depression, for instance, is one of the biggest predictors of social, emotional and behavioural delay. Um, I've kind of covered this already just, just now, but... Um, you know, just to talk about prematurity, obviously, um, you know, the the more more severely premature a baby is, then the greater the risk is for developmental delay, um, and that is why you know when it, when we talk about premature babies, you know, they will be followed up lots. You know, there'll be a neonatal clinic for a really long time, not just for whatever issue they might have had with prematurity, but also to check their development. Um, and up until two years of age, we correct for prematurity. And this is the equation that you might want to remember, um, which is to, you know, to work out the corrected age for a baby. Um, so, you know, the age in weeks uh, minus 40 minus their gestation in weeks. Um, and when it comes to prematurity, up until two years of age, really, you know, any milestone that you'd expect for a child of normal age, you need to add on you know the time you you need to work it out for the corrected age for the child and um, you know they will be hitting all the milestones later than you know a term baby and that's expected so i don't think i haven't really found out a way to make this more palatable um so it's just one of those that again you can just have to remember um but we talk you know first of all we start with the child being able to smile at six weeks um, then once they can reach for objects, they start putting food in their mouth. Uh, by nine months old, they are afraid of strangers and have, you know, object permanence and people leaving. Um, by 12 months old, they're a lot more interactive. 
they can wave bye bye you know imagine a child starts walking away from you and they go bye you know and so that's how it matches a gross motor um but 18 months old they can imitate you know adults they can eat with a spoon and by two months old really this is when this uh, domain really flourishes so children start you know, to have more symbolic play they can eat very well by three years old most children tend to be dry during the day and they you know it means they can be more social with other children and they can share toy and eat with a fork and by four um you know imagine that child that is now walking like an adult and talking like an adult can also have very vivid imaginative play you know very close friendships so start having close friendships by this age so again red flags worth remembering um one that's really important to parents is the age at which a child should smile. And, you know, by eight weeks, children should really be smiling um, and should be afraid of strangers by 10 months. Um, the other ones are a little bit harder to remember, I guess. So symbolic play, play interactive play. Um, and I mean, feeding self, I guess, is another good one. You know, it's just a nice round age. Two years old, they should be able to feed themselves and hold a spoon. Um, and the, you know, the play ones are a bit, a bit tricky to remember. I'm not sure how relevant they are, but here we go. OK, so we've completed our table of development. Um, so I don't know if you guys uh, want to make a note of this or take a screenshot, take a little picture um, just to remember. Um, as a little summary of what you expect, you know, I've picked out the main ages that you'll probably be asked about in exams, I guess. These are the ones, you know, rather than seven and ten months, we often talk about you know, six weeks, six months, nine months and so on. You know, we go up by three months and then 18, two and three. Um, so question five. See if you guys have been listening. <laughs> Ooh, okay, room is a little divided here. So <laughs> I feel like there's still, you know, a good number of you got it right. Um, so yeah, this is a little bit trickier, but you might get these sort of questions. And you this really requires you to pierce together all the domains. Um, so you know, I think 15 months, three cubes is perhaps a little bit too young. Um, although they might walk and eating with a spoon as well. Um, and then, you know, you know, she's not two years old because they don't say very many words and they, you know, um, can't stack more cubes. You know, by two year old, we expect them to be a little bit older. But, you know, roughly probably this child is about 18 months old. So I've summarized a little bit what you're, you would expect a child in the first year of life to be able to do, um, you know, in all the various domains. And I think the first year is perhaps the one that's a little bit harder, but also more important to remember, which is where you'll pick out a lot of the developmental delays. You know, parents are paying a lot of attention to these babies when they're up to one year old and spending a lot of time together. You know, so a six week old, Imagine, you know, a little baby just sitting around, rolling happily, they just can you know, hold their head up, smile and turn to sound. By four months old, they're a little bit more interactive, they're rolling over. They, now they've rolled over, they can reach for things and stick them in the mouth. 
by six months, they should be, you know, they can sit up perhaps and they can move their objects from hand to hand. They make little sounds. They're looking at you. They're interactive. And nine months, they're starting to stand with a little bit of help, but they can probably crawl. They're picking things up from the floor with a little pizza grasp. And now that they've realized their mom and dad walk out of the room, they call for them and they're afraid of strangers. And then by 12 months old, you have a child that is now walking and it's, you know, knows which parent they want, can wave you bye bye and are pretty good at picking up objects and they might be throwing them at you as well. <laughs> OK, so by the first year of life, think about goals that a child should be achieving, which I think is a nice summary would be, you know, they need to be able to walk, to pinch the grass and to say one word with meaning. And, um, you know, I think that will help you remember what happens up until a year of age. OK, question six. Well done. So I think, you know, this question really um, is more to make you guys think about the healthy child program and why it's important in development and why we test for certain things, you know, within that program. So, oh, sorry, my laptop just froze. So the ages that we talk about, you know, the median ages in development aren't completely random. Um, and that's, you know, the reason why we prefer these ages rather than any others is because, they match certain checkpoints, um, you know, as part of the Healthy Child Programme, at which children are seen by professionals and they can pick out, you know, any issues with their development. So the Healthy Child Programme is, um, you know, a way to sort of watch children grow and care for their health and their normal development, um, which um, follows children from pregnancy technically up until 19 years of age, However, most of the program is really focused between the time between pregnancy and five years old. And it includes all of these professionals and all of these um, opportunities to take a look at the child. Um, so midwifery, you know, checks, so antenatal and postnatal care. There are five health visitor reviews. There's newborn checks, six, six to eight week check immunization and school checks. Um, I think it's, you know, I don't think it's that obvious. People don't really often talk about this as a way to measure development, but it is quite a useful way to think about it. Um, so this is sort of a timeline, um, again, to give you an idea of, you know, the ages that we talk about. So, you know, six week, one year, and all the opportunities that we have to review development in these children. And every professional should really be doing this every time they see the child, you know, it shouldn't just be up to the parents to you know, raise concerns because we do have all these chances to see them. Um, so, you know, I won't go too much into this, but just to give you guys a gist. Okay, question set.
<laughs> yeah, well done. Um, so this is just kind of a question to lead uh, nicely into causes of developmental delay, as you all rightly identified, you know, not being able to stand and showing hand dominance in a 12 month old, not necessarily normal, and the most likely cause of a specific delay in motor, gross motor is cerebral palsy. Um, so when we talk about developmental delay, we split it into two main categories specific developmental delay like the one in our child in question seven where it tends to be focused on only one domain and global which includes two or more de domains so don't fall into the mistake of thinking that global developmental delay means it has to involve all of the domains but just two or more are enough really and developmental delay can be reversible um especially if picked up early, which is why we do so many checks in children, um, because so many causes, you know, we can reverse quite early on. So have a go at this one. today work with regard to a brow lift so number one we talked about the two different modalities that we can use to achieve a brow lift in reality i'm not sure what that was i think it was me Uh -huh. So, well done. So the majority of you guys picked out that the right answer here is genetic karyotyping. Um, and that's because we're talking about global developmental delay. There's a few domains that this child is struggling with. Now, I've left the question as it was because this is how it's gone on your question bank. But the latest guidelines, which have changed you know, recently in the last year, uh, the, the best investigation now is actually chromosomal microarray. Um, and that's because compared to karyotyping, which is, you know, just looking sort of the chromosome, chromosomal microarray can look at smaller defects in the chromosomes. So it's just a lot more sensitive. You know, it can pick out micro deletion duplications, which is why it's now first line for global developmental delay rather than karyotyping. But out of all the options mentioned, um, karyotyping is still you know the best option, um, and it will be most useful when it comes to identifying a cause for global developmental delay. Now, just briefly talking about specific delay, um, so there's we kind of divide it you know delayed walking and talking rather than going into you know all the different you know social aspects um because these are the way uh, sort of these conditions will manifest uh, more evidently so um for instance cerebral palsy or duchenne um you know a child will struggle with walking um syndromic children you know children have a syndrome might have just delayed walking um, rather than fine motor and speech issues. And then, you know, with fine motor, we mentioned problems with the eyes, so cataracts and glaucoma, or any problems with optic nerves. They tend to be the main reason why you have a specific delay in fine motor rather than also in gross motor. Um, and then delayed speech. Again, things related with hearing. Um, but also, like I mentioned, is the most sensitive domain um, to environmental. Um, so things like poor social interaction, deprivation, um, or familial, you know, um, language delay can also have an impact. Um, and then we're going a bit more down the neuropsychological route if this happens, especially as a child is developing pretty well otherwise. Now, in terms of global delay, instead, um, 
you know, it becomes a little bit more complicated because it could be so many things, but really it boils down to, it tends to be sort of genetic uh, conditions, especially chromosomal disorders. You know, 40% of all global delay is due to chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and then things like that affect the brain as a whole, like hydrocephalus or prenatal problems that affect brain development, like teratogens and hypothyroidism. And then, you know, we've talked about prematurity and how that's a problem for development and not just prematurity by itself, but all sorts of other complications with prematurity, you know, um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, um, retinopathy of prematurity. All of these problems can cause developmental delay um, and obviously anything that happens after birth, you know, like brain injury and meningitis and TNS infection and things like that. So, you know, it becomes a little bit more vast. Um, now, in terms of how we um, investigate and evaluate developmental delay, now it's really important to take a very good history of these children and try and find out, you know, what, what domain, how many are affected, when did it start, was there any regression, uh, which is very important, you know, did they meet their milestones and then they went backwards. Um, and then we'll often do just some baseline blood tests to screen for global developmental delay, which always include uh, creatine kinase and thyroid function uh, to look for congenital hypothyroidism, which is a you know, reversible cause. Um, and then in old children now, we do chromosomal microarray, which is the highest yield, uh, although you know, it used to be karyotyping. And then you do other things like the metabolic screen and make sure you don't have any, you know, um, metabolic disorders and um, audiology, ophthalmology. You start looking at more, you know, specific things like infection, screened mum for, um, you know, torch infections. And we'd often do an MRI just to make sure the brain is all there. OK, so just last question now. Well done. So we, we did talk about most of the others in terms of their reversibility, but fetal alcohol syndrome is one of those causes which is often forgotten um, that uh, leads to global developmental delay, partly because there is quite a lot of stigma around it and, you know, uh, maternal drinking and pregnancy and things like that. But unfortunately, once that's happened, it is irreversible. However, all of the others, you know, the other falls are reversible if caught early enough, which again, it comes back to the importance of prevention and screening in um, development. So, um, <laughs> repeating myself, but uh, when it comes to managing, you know, developmental delay, the most important is, you know, prevention. And that's why we do lots of screening. Um, you know, we screen mothers for infectious diseases and uh, anemia, and you give them supplements, again, to make things a little bit better when the child is born. Um, and then, you know, we'd always look at development as a um, multidisciplinary team approach which people love in exams <laughs> and in real life and you'll be looking at all of the causes and also you know once a child does have perhaps you know a delay that it's caused by something irreversible then you will need all those members of the team to support the child to grow to their best potential um, and so you know in their pediatric centers this whole team will be off and around so you have speech and language 
um, you know, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, social workers, psychology will be involved both for the child and the family. And, um, you know, I didn't mention so much about screening tests uh, because they're, they're used in like a clinical, you know, specialist setting rather than in GP or in any of the um you know, settings I mentioned as part of the Healthy Child Programme, but there are screening tests, which I don't think you should really know too much about, uh, but they can be used once a concern has been raised, say by any of the professionals in the multidisciplinary team. Um, some scales that you might have heard of, um, you know, there's a Denver scale, the Griffiths assessment, just names, you know, to remember, you don't need to go into any particular detail with these because they're very lengthy and comprehensive. And often these, you know, comes with a kit for an assessment that will be done in a developmental clinic um, by a specialist, you know, community pediatrician, for instance. So that's it. We've gone, come to the end of the lecture. Thanks, guys, for bearing with me. So we can have a little look at questions. And I was just going to go back while I answer your question to that summary slide in case someone still wanted to take a look at it. Um, and here we go. Fine. So let's have a look at questions. Uh, what does raises head to prone actually mean? Um, <laughs> it means, uh, good question. What does it actually mean? Um, it, it basically it means they can raise their head so the whole body is in line together you know they're not kind of when you lift them up their head is kind of flopping behind they can raise their head and keep it to you know at the same level of the rest of the body it, you know it's kind of like a measure of head control you know it's kind of like you'll see very young children you pick them up and the head kind of bubbles and wobbles around uh, you know that's you'd expect them to be able to hold it up um, that's kind of what you want to see um, in question two, why is it vision as opposed to fine motor? Uh, let me just go back to that question so I can tell you. Um, um, so, I guess it's a little bit more specific, you know, the domain is vision and fine motor, um, but you'll be you'll be, you know, the fact that the child is not fixing and following is very specific to vision. A four month old, you know, you wouldn't expect them to be able to do so much in terms of fine motor. Um, so if you can correct their vision now, you might still be able to correct, um, to correct their fine, you know, to make sure that they don't get fine motor delay um, later on. So that's why uh, fine is vision. Uh, so casting is what I mentioned, it's throwing objects across the room. Um, the purpose of casting, I wouldn't say it necessarily has a purpose, uh, just children love throwing stuff around. Um, and, you know, they kind of, at a certain age, they should stop just chucking things, uh, you know, uh, without a meaning you know they'll be throwing it to you to play with or they'll be passing it to you but not necessarily just throwing them throwing them around the room um, so symbolic play means um it, it's kind of like um how do you say um that's a bit hard to explain i think the best way i can explain it to you is um it's not pretend play, but it's it's playing with with an intention, with a meaning. You know, something with. Um, uh, I, I'm really not explaining this well. <laughs> I'm sure there's a very nice definition of this on Google, uh, which is not coming to me right now. But it's it's kind of you know, um, um, yeah, uh, kind of playing with a meaning. I don't know if that's helpful at all, sorry. And someone's asking to go back to question two, uh, but we're on question two here if you want. Um, how would you know to check for chromosomal karyotyping and not CK in that question? Um, so the reason why you do chromosomal karyotyping rather than CK is because the child was having global developmental delay rather than say specific for gross motor. And when it comes to global developmental delay, 
you should the the most useful investigation which is what the question was asking will be to do karyotyping or chromosomal microarray um, because that will likely give you the answer for global developmental delay because as i mentioned you know 40 percent of all children with global developmental delay will have a chromosomal abnormality so that's the highest yield you know ck will only really tell you about um neuromuscular conditions is particularly good for Duchenne's, but also things like spinal muscular atrophy. Um, it's not necessarily specific to global developmental delay or you know the most useful. And the final question was, what is meant to dry by day? Uh, so dry by day means they are not wetting themselves during the day. Um, so you know they can wear a nappy, but they won't have to pee in the middle of the day. So they might still uh, wet themselves at night, uh, you know, bed wetting at night. Uh, but in the daytime, uh, they will be able to hold it and go to the toilet. Okay. Um, and I'm checking if there's anything else in the chat. I think it's the same question. Great. All right. Thanks so much, guys. I think that's it for tonight. <laughs>